Good morning, everybody. Or oh, good afternoon. Um, special welcome to Pete from Exeter. It's quite often we have uh, a bishop giving a talk on a Saturday morning. Don't worry about this. It's quite noble behaviour. Normal for Bradford. Last month we had uh, the Colombian Super League, so we thought we'd stick with the international theme and we'd go with uh, Finnish football culture. Now, Glyn not only walks around Bradford dressed as a uh, Belisha Beacon bishop, he's also, his mother was Finnish, so he's well in touch with all things Finnish, including ice hockey, I guess. Um, what other indoor things because it's uh, and terrible football so i'll pass you on to glenn uh, welcome cheers guys so, so my name's glenn and this is going to be mostly about my mother but there will be some football like those of you who are going to the game today there will be some football possibly although judging by recent uh, standards and also I am, this is part, officially, come on, work, that's it. Officially, this is part of um, Bishop Blaze's Long Woolly Fringe Festival. So, Bishop Blaze was an official... It's, it's like Norman Collier. Bishop Blaze was, a, was a, an Armenian bishop who had his head chopped off after having his skin, uh, his skin scraped off with iron combs. This made him the patron saint of Walcomers, because if you wanted to be on the Premier League of Saints, you either had to know Jesus by his first name or be done to death in a particularly grisly manner. Who would remember St. Catherine if she hadn't been nailed to a wheel? So anyway, there's Bishop Blaze. He also saved a child uh, from choking on a fishbone. So he's the patron saint of throat troubles, German brass bands, the city of Dubrovnik and the wall train. And this is a beer that uh, Salamander made for us um, a couple of years ago. This year, the beer's done by um, Sunday, Blaze Ale. I don't think they've got it in here, but they have had it in the Sparrow and the um, uh, la, la, da, 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 Peacock. So this is me dressed up in my normal everyday attire in front of the uh, statue of Bishop Blaze that is at the end of the Wall Exchange. So if you're in Bradford, then you know the Royal Exchange, big clock tower, Market Street. If you look up, there's a king who's Edward III, and there is a bishop holding a wool coat. And I do have a wool coat, but I'm not going to fiddle about looking for it. I'm actually doing a presentation in Kirgit Market, which is why I'm dressed up, and I will be going back there as soon as I've finished this talk and I've finished my pint. This procession, 1811, this may be Bradford in 1811. 1825, so uh, Bradford Walcomers had an uh, organised procession every seven... Bradford Walcomers organised a procession every seven years and um, six other towns did it because it, everybody in the trade took part and... Sorry? So everyone in the wool trade took part from the richest to the uh, poorest and the last one, 1825, a thousand people, the Walcomers went on strike with the handloom weavers, never happened again. 23 week uh, strike, children were starving, banks went bankrupt. The first dispensary in Bradford was set up to help the starving poor, and that's the direct descendant of Br uh, uh, BRI and of all the health services in Bradford. So 1825 will be the 200th anniversary of that, 200th anniversary of uh, health service in Bradford, and 200th anniversary of the first Catholic church, modern Catholic church to be opened in Bradford. So 1825, if we get capital of culture, you know, great. If we don't, we still celebrate, um, no matter how miserable we might be, uh, especially after you come home from the game today. Um, <laughs> You can tell I'm not going, can't you? Even if I weren't in there, I'd find something else to do. So, uh, 7th of August is the next big thing uh, for the Long Woolly Fringe, and that's the wool fair that should have happened last Sunday, but I've moved it back in uh, six months. So, you haven't been to the Industrial Museum since you either were a kid or you took your own kid. So, get up to the Industrial Museum, there may be a bar. They have been the last few times. Oh, and that's my mother. So that's the reason for my talk. So this is 65 years old, 1995. We're in Finland. And she was saying, we went to a, a, a museum. like a, And she says, oh, this is just like our barn. Um, and then she showed me what she used to do when she was five years old, rather than 65 years old. 
This is possibly a reason why I've grown up to be such a shy, retiring kind of man, as you can tell. And, well, that's Finland. I'll come back to this. The red bits. Uh, my mother was actually born in the, in the red bit down the bottom. Uh, Karela, as they say, or Karelia, as uh, you say. Karelia sweet Sibelius. And this is my artistic impression of Finland in winter. Um, I was doing... Uh, a friend, uh, one of my cousins, I used to be a teacher, and one of my cousins, in fact both my cousins were teachers. And I've been over and I've taught English lessons, like, I can't speak Finnish, but I stood in front of the class as the, as the, uh, as the uh, kids came in. This is uh, 14 years old, so they've already got plenty of English. And I didn't say anything, and one of them actually eventually put their hand up and says, who are you? And I says, well, my name's uh, Mr. Watkins or Glyn Watkins. Uh, I'm the cousin of uh, your teacher, Cyril Patimonen. And it's, uh, uh, anyway, we're, so we're having, the, we're having the lesson. And they asked me about the weather. And I says, well, if this was England, if this was Britain, and we had this snow, and I pointed out the window, and one of them said, what snow? And I said, that, that white stuff out there, and says, that's not snow, it's only a centimetre deep. You know, and I was saying, look, if this had happened where I live, everything would have ground to an halt and nobody would have left the house. So this is Finland. Eight, uh, 1939, November, my mother said it was so cold that if you left a bucket of water outside, it would freeze within two or three minutes. We're talking about minus 30 degrees centigrade in, uh, in, in a bad winter in Finland, which is why the Finns play this. This is their national sport, and at this point, I'm going to take some clothes off, and I'm going to put on... Uh, <laughs> so, so, this is my uh, Finnish um, ice hockey shirt with Karela, which is a now best known as a Finnish beer, um, but that's why I bought it. This is where my mother was born. Um, and when the Finns won the uh, World Championship for the first time, Finland winning the World Championship in ice hockey is like Leicester winning the uh, Premier League, except Leicester will never be allowed to win it again, because that's not what the Premier League's about. <laughs> it's about rich teams winning, whereas Finland have won it two more times. Um, and so that shirt, I was in Finland in um, uh, 1995. This is, they beat Sweden 4 1, and then Gilde Inn was a Finnish pop hit, uh, like Back Home, which two guy, Swedish guys, sorry, two Swedish guys did to big up the team, big up the, uh, the best team in the world, who got beaten by Finland 4-1, and there was a significant increase in the birth rate nine months after they beat them. <laughs> and the last time they won the uh, World Championship, the Ice Hockey World Championship, 50,000 Finns turned up in Finland. There's only five million of the beggars any road. So that's, that's what, one in a hundred? One in, no, one in a thousand Finns turned up in, uh, no, one in a hundred, one in a hundred Finns. It's like, it's like 600,000 or 700,000 people turning up in London if England ever win anything, which is technically possible. Let's face it, like Bradford City winning today is technically possible. So, Finland, uh, Finland's national sport is a winter sport, so football's a summer sport, but they don't play football in, in Finland much in the summer because they play this, Peskapallo, which is a Finnish version of baseball where you throw the ball straight up in the air, the pitcher throws it up and it's got to go at least a metre above the batsman or batwoman's head. You run about 200 metres to, uh, to get back home and you zigzag. I mean, let's face it, if we tried it here, you'd forget where you were going. Um, and also, if you are caught, you're not out. And if you hit the board so hard, it goes beyond the boundary line, it's a foul ball and it doesn't count. 
So it's very similar to baseball, but completely different. The, and it's played by people, that, countries that have got a lot of Finns in, i.e. Canada and Australia, and Sweden, of course. Uh, and you've got the bloke at the back holding up the peacock's tail is the manager who tells his runners what they're supposed to do according to colour code. Again, I think this will be a bit sophisticated for some professional sportsmen. <laughs> and on to finish football, you can't see it because the projector's obviously knackered, but it's the only one I've got at the minute. Uh, HJK Helsinki is the biggest team in Finland, has been pretty much the entire history of Finnish football, which is very short. There was no league in Finland until 1930. Before that, the championship was decided by knockout. So presumably some teams played one, one competitive game a season before 1930. But nobody bothered because nobody played football. My mother said she didn't hear about football. She knew nothing about it until she came to England in 1949. But she was the best hitter in her Pesco Palo uh, uh, team for, at school. Because by God, you didn't mess with me mother. I only saw her throw a knife at me father once, but uh, <laughs> once was enough. So, HJK uh, Helsinki, biggest team in Finland, their average gate last season, uh, in the summer obviously, was 5,101. And that's twice the average gate of any other team in the Finnish league. So, there you go. And obviously, if you like a lot of countries, if you're a good footballer in Finland, you don't play in Finland. And in fact, the kids that I was teaching, the older kids, they all wanted to know, and they knew far more about English football than they did about Finnish football. Because why would you bother? This is the Finnair Stadium. It's one of two stadiums in Helsinki. And I have been to two football matches, which is two more football matches than most Finns have been to. And the game I went to, I was stood up here, right at the top, and there was a gap behind me, and it was a lovely sunny day with the wind off the Urals, blowing right up me, right, oh God, it was cold. You know, me, 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 I was getting sunburnt on my face, and me, the, re, the back of me was getting very, very chilly. It was a sellout game because it was a... Um, uh, World Cup qualifier against Albania, um, Finland won, as you can see, 2-1, and I saw one of the dirtiest, nastiest fouls I've ever seen in my life, almost as bad as Kevin Gray breaking Gordon Watson's leg when, he, uh, when we were playing Huddersfield, and it was by uh, Hupia, uh, who crippled, I reckon, the um, uh, Muka. I didn't get a report of this, so this is, I got this off the internet yesterday. Quite literally, nobody stood anywhere near him. The action down the other end of the bar, uh, other end of the field, he ran up behind him and he did the back of his, uh, his ankle. Quite deliberate. Like, uh, you, as I say, Finns are very good at killing people quietly and slowly, as the Russians found out when they invaded in, uh, in uh, 1939. Um, and nobody apart from me saw it. The television cameras that were covering it were pointing the other end. It was absolutely Assassin Creed sort of stuff. Anyway, back to me mother. So that's a, a picture of me mother who'd just fallen over doing something daft and was holding a, 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 a cold lager can to her head while she was recovering, like, you know, like me mother did. And this is me mother in about 1925 when she was four years old. She grew up in a farm that had no electricity. They only started getting um, oil lamps after she was born. Her father used to take the fat out of dead sheep to render it down to make rush lights with. Um, so there's my mother there, wondering what this strange man is doing. Everybody in the photos uh, gone now. My mother was the last person in the family to, well, for me to bury um, and they were self-sufficient apart from anything else they had sheep and cows which my grandfather used to shear with hand shears obviously and my grandmother sorted the wool my mother can't remember much about that but she did know that the stuff around the arse of the sheep went for slippers because he didn't throw anything away 
So the dirty wall was made into felt for slippers and they carded it, they carded it themselves and they spun it themselves. That's not your mother, that's just a random uh, woman like spinning. Um, and then she came to England in 1949 um, as a domestic servant and she met me dad and you know got married and then had children including a, 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 well, a fat little me um, and then uh, and a, my older brother that, and yes yes I've heard all the jokes about the milkman so my el elder brother became a monk and I became just a normal bloke as you can uh, as you can <laughs> And my mother was the only one to leave Finland, but quite a few of her uh, brothers and sisters moved to Sweden because that's where the work, work was after the war. The Swedes made so much money flogging, uh, flogging uh, iron ore to the Nazis in return for gold that there was plenty of work in, uh, in Sweden. So this is my, my Uncle Sundari's family, apart from this lady who's Sirpa, who's... Um, uh, and. The thing about going to Finland with my mother, I couldn't speak Finnish. She spoke Finnish to my brother, and then when he went to uh, kindergarten in Australia, where he was born, he didn't speak. He didn't speak because he's my brother, you know, and he didn't want to talk to anybody. So she stopped talking Finnish to him and never talked Finnish to me. So I don't speak Finnish, but going to Finland me meant that you had to watch Finnish television, get extremely bored, use an outhouse built on a, a rock, um, in the summer, because they all had summer houses, and I'm telling you, you go to an outhouse built on a rock after it's been used for a few months, and you, you uh, as a, as a seven-year-old child, you know what nightmares are about. And you get moved about, you got moved about Finland like a sack of potatoes from one set of cousins I couldn't tell from another. And the second game was 18, let, let me think about this, 20, it would have been 2095 again. I asked to go and see a, a league game. And uh, they said, okay, let's take you to see a league game. And then come the Saturday, I'm going, and then the cousin who was taking me went, obviously in Finnish, oh, oh, Pasca, because uh, he completely forgot. We went, got to the game, nobody could tell me who was playing who. There were no programs left. I watched, uh, I watched, I watched, 70 minutes of a game where one team may have won but nobody seemed to know. Nobody was watching! How was the, they, were, they were all eating hot dogs or drinking beer, apart from some of them in the middle who were playing a bit. Um, and I still to this day don't know who, who the earth I was watching. <laughs> so, uh, that's Big Arrow, that's where my mother lived. Eight kilometres from the Russian border. Um, November 30th, 1939, um, it got, all goes down. Uh, Finland gets invaded by the Soviet Union. Soviet Union's got 20 million men under arms, no, 2 million men under arms. Finland's got something like 400,000. Every man was in the army, was conscripted. They have universal conscription still then. But Finland had 30 tanks, the, the Russians had 2,000. The Russians had 1,500 uh, uh, aeroplanes, fighting aeroplanes, the Finns had about a hundred. So everyone assumed the Russians were going to be in Helsinki within three or four days. That's what uh, Stalin said and that's what Molotov, his, uh, his Minister of Propaganda said. The house, which, this is off Google Maps, the, uh, the house is in Karku. This is my mother on the left and Auntie Claudia on the right. This is later in the war, um, but when the Russians invaded, the uh, family were told they had to leave straight away and they knew it was coming, but my me, me grandmother was panicking. My mother helped my grandmother get dressed. Uh, she, didn't put, she didn't put her winter clothes on, she put galoshes over her overshoes. Uh, her and my auntie were the last person to leave. She locked the door, she went back, got her Bible, locked the door, and she reckoned there was a man at the end of the, a soldier at the end of the field. And then when she's walking away, a Finnish soldier saw them and, and swore at them, saying, I'm the last Finnish man here. So the soldier at the end of the field would have been a Red Army soldier. So she was that close, they were that close to being captured or killed. 
they crossed two bridges which the Finnish army blew up as soon as they had crossed. So the lo literally the last two people to cross the bridges before the Finnish army blew them up. Because the Finnish army was using skirt, scorched earth policy. Oh, sorry, well, we're going. Uh, and they walked between the red, the two red arrows, between uh, Karukko and Sotavala, which according to Google Earth is a 62 mile walk. And they did that in temperatures of minus 30. Um, they got to the train station, they, found, they, they were evacuated uh, because the Finns had planned for this um, and she finally got reunited with her parents but after walking through snow that was thigh deep and getting frostbite which affected her legs for the rest of her life. Um, Finland was well, everybody loved Finland because uh, Russia was part, was an ally of Hitler until the Germans invaded uh, Russia or the Soviet Union, they were allies. Um, and fin uh, Churchill, the French and the British con seriously considered invading Norway to go to the aid of the Finns. So the Norwegian campaign was set up so they could go and help the Finns. Let's invade Norway, then invade Sweden, and then arrive in Finland and help the Finns fight the Russians. Yeah, the Russians got, had a bloody nose and were ground into the ground until the spring. While, the, while it was snowing, the Russians had no answer. And the Russians were sending men, they were put, taking men from the desert, putting them on the tra trains and putting them off in Finland. Um, anyway, the Finns were helped. Britain gave Finland, does anyone know what this plane is? Yes, it's a Hawk Hurricane, they gave, they gave uh, Britain gave uh, Finland a squadron of Hawk Hurricanes. They also gave Russia a squadron of Hawk Hurricanes later in the war when they became an ally. It's quite possible that Hawk Hurricanes uh, shot at each other, uh, but I can't confirm that. The swastika, I've put that up there for a reason. The swastika came because the first aircraft given to the Finnish Air Force was from a Swede, and the swastika was his personal symbol the Germans got the swastika from the Finns because the Germans fought against the communist Finns in the, in the chaos of the Russian Revolution. Finland had its own revolution, but the, the, the Bolsheviks lost. So, and that personal symbol almost certainly came from the swastika that used to be on Rudyard Kipling's books because Rudyard Kipling's symbol was a swastika because he was born in uh, India. And this is, this is, this is, this isn't, I haven't written this down, so some, some beggar's going to nick it. Um, other stories, my mother saw Hitler, uh, she, we were watching World at War, and she says, oh, I've seen him, and I says, seen him, and I says, seen, seen Hitler, and I said, yeah, and you've seen Gandhi and JFK as well. And it turned out she had seen Hitler. He was the last place, the last place he visited before he, um, uh, before the end of the war was Finland, to try and keep him in the war. The Finns made a separate peace with the Russians, with the, with the Soviets, and they're the only part of the Soviet Empire that, uh, sorry, the Tsarist Empire that never became part of the, um, the Soviet Empire. So they survived, and there's lots of reasons for that, for putting up a bloody good fight. Also, two little stories. My mother was washing, the, washing clothes with a, with a dolly outside, and she saw that, she said, oh, they were bombing Sotavala. So she got up, to look at the bombs falling on Sotovar and she bent that back down and a hail of bullets passed over her head and cut the, uh, she said they cut the elderly bushes that high and I said what did you do? He says I got, I jumped up, waved my fist and swore at them. Oh. <laughs> anyway I'm going to stop it at that, um, that's 25 minutes of, uh, of uh, very rough Finnish uh, woolly history. Uh, has anyone got any questions and if not I'm going to finish my beer and beg her off. Well, that was it. That was an interesting talk, wasn't it? We went everywhere <laughs> from Finland to Bishop Blairs to wherever. Our next talk is on the 5th of March. Dr. Chris Stride is going to talk about the weird and wonderful world of sporting statues. So we're looking forward to that. The 5th of March next one. But thanks very much, Glenn. Cheers.
Saint-Denis, mais 